church.
Lord, we thank you for dying for us on this cross of Calvary. Father God, we pray for the cross tonight, oh God. We pray, oh Father God, tonight, oh Father God, have to stand here down here, oh God, and teach us our soul, oh God, for mission. And of course, for mission, oh God, get the word to the cross. And supporting, oh Father God, them on the end of it. Right now, oh God, we pray for the offering that we're about to take up the cross. We pray for the giver and receiver. We pray that we continue to commit to give, oh God, unto the missions, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray.
I'll be willing to bet that your pastor appreciates your faithfulness to the church and the Baptist. It's very encouraging to your pastor knowing that he, he has those people that are going to be here, regardless of who's preaching, regardless of who's singing, regardless of who's going on at the church. When the church doors are open, you, you ladies and, and men are going to be here no matter what. And uh, that, that lifts him up. And encourages your pastor, I'm sure, without a doubt. So thank you for being faithful to this uh, mission conference. And again, thank you, Pastor, for allowing me the opportunity and the privilege uh, to be here and to put this thing together and to have these fine uh, men and women to come down with me and, and uh, use their personal expenses and, and their time and put a lot of things aside, including new babies or grandbabies, I should say. Uh, to be here with you guys, I, I truly appreciate that. I don't take any of that for granted. And uh, it's a lot of work uh, to get down here and, and put together these sermons night after night and to come out here and, and to preach your heart out. Uh, some people think they just get up here and speak, but I'm here to tell you, preaching will wear you out. Uh, you, you get everything that's in your heart, and you speak what God's given to you, you walk out of this pulpit tired. It is a lot of work, but it's also a great joy. And again, we thank you and we thank the Lord for the opportunity. And uh, again, tonight, I'm, I'm sure you're tired. You've been working all day, and we're now almost midweek. And uh, we're going to try to respect that tonight and get out of here to do some time. Uh, but I want to introduce somebody to you. Uh, he's no stranger to this area, and certainly not a stranger to this church. I hesitate to call him my friend because sometimes I'm not sure if we're friends or enemies, but we love each other nonetheless. And uh, I asked him as, as service started, I said, how did we even meet? And, and we don't have a clue. Um, it's kind of like, maybe I shouldn't even say this, it's kind of like husband and wife. We have that love-hate relationship. Uh, but we have many hours together flying in the air across the ocean. And uh, preaching and giving testimonies throughout these islands. And it's been such a blessing to be with this man. And, and we talk uh, probably two to three times a week and, and just encourage each other. And I know without a doubt that if I've got something on my heart or something's bothering me, this is the man that I can call uh, that will be there and support me and talk me through it. And I'll tell you what I want to hear. You tell me what I need to hear. And thus say it the Lord. Amen. Daddy, come on up here and share your testimony with us. Amen. Church, what a blessing to have this man stand this morning and uh, share some of his important testimony. Uh, everything that our brother Lee Gay said was true. I mean, one thing he left out was that it's good for a guy like me. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, I've uh, flown many miles across the ocean and uh, all around these islands and had really deep conversations and challenged each other as well as described what they guys want us to do. And uh, we truly is an example of uh, Iron Duck. And, uh, that's what we get to do. We hold each other accountable. We speak truth into each other's lives. We check up on each other. something that I think that uh, we've been conditioned to give a quick story about the gospel. And that is not the best part. It's also the best part. Your salvation story is important. And you read your church person and you tell it. But really, the whole thing is the same. Every day is part of that journey. So I want to give you a glimpse of my testimony. I want to take you into the journey that I've been. And I'll start with the Baptist. When I look back on my life as a person, it's hard to even recognize. I don't recognize the Christian that I am. And I think that that is part of the testimony of who I am in Christ. But I don't even recognize that person you know, 20 years ago. This is a guy who chased money. I chased all kinds of things that I'm not even going to mention up here. I did things people against people against people and there's no mention of those people as kids in the 
every time you would see me when I would come work on the cameras and just swing the back of the TV and say, hey man, we're going to jam out this Sunday, you ought to come check it out.
You went back home and sent a thousand, I think, I don't know, why did I send a thousand letters to churches? I did two TV interviews. I did five radio interviews. I talked to every member of my family. I went back to the Colorado office and said, hey man, do you have any money for me? I'd like to be a missionary. And two months went by, I raised a job.
and put all these things on me, and it just seemed ridiculous. Sure enough, the doctor came in after an hour and was tired and ready to go home. I've been church all day, just being a good Christian boy. The doctor came in, she's like, hey, you don't have a stomach. You didn't have a stomach. I'm like, that's right. She was just that brain tumor. It's like, well, what? How does, what do you mean I have a brain tumor? Suddenly, my world stopped. The perfect Christian life that I had created, that if God saved me, I created this little Christian bubble for myself, was awful. God had my attention. This journey I was on suddenly was not going anywhere. My first thoughts were, how could God do this? My second thought was like, we gotta pray right now. The third thing that happened was the nurse walked in and told me a story about her brother who found dead in a car in London because he had a brain tumor and it wasn't an hospital. All right, maybe you're not today. <laughs> that was an attack because fear was suddenly relevant. I was not gonna let that in. My wife and I dropped our knees right there at the hospital, hospital room and we prayed. We were like, God, it's just, if I live, you're glorified. If I die, you're glorified. And that's just going to happen. That's how it's going to do it. And if you have my life in your hands, the next step is this. This is your journey. This is not mine. You take me where we're going to go. Like, Lord, I don't know. I just don't make it hurt. They left out of there not knowing what to do. A week goes by, and I'm taking multiple MRIs. They write that MRI. You're laying that machine. And you're like, what's that? I'm like a heart scan. That MRI is like in a tube. They're looking at my head and poking things in my arm, and I'm sick of doing it. And contemplating my mortality at that point and my poor kids and the ministry that God had promised me. And I decided on the sixth MRI, I would just lay there and I would just pray. That's the only thing I had left. It was just me and my wife and God. Everything had been about me. And the only thing I could do was talk to my dad about this in a box. So I laid there and I prayed. Like God, you, you got this, and I trust you, and I pray for the doctors, and I lift them up. And I'm not a person who has faith and prophecy that's not a spiritual figure. But as I laid there in that MRI, I knew what the tumor looked like. The tumor created this, and I could clearly see that the brain tumor, chartreuse yellow, bright, bright yellow. And God's voice speaking to me saying, "It's gone. You're healed." And watching the tumor. 45 minutes, I couldn't shake the tumor. I closed my eyes, so that both of my eyes clearly could see it. It was tangible to me. I got out of the MRI and rushed into the thing, and you're not going to believe what happened. So I think I'm going crazy. She's like, What do you think it is? I said, I think I'm this. I had peace in that moment. I had a peace that was without understanding. As everybody around me was panicking my relatives, my kids, my wife, how are we going to come up with $90,000 in seven days? And 
down to the river.
mighty way and these folks lost, Lord. I pray we open our hearts and minds to what you'll have for us. So, Lord, I ask tonight that you would help me. Lord, I can't preach the precious truth upon my own strength. Lord, would you empty me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit? Lord, say we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your many blessings you give us each and every day. In Christ's name, I do ask it for us. Amen. Thank you, may be seated. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's word. As it's been mentioned a few times tonight, or in the past couple of services, I hope that you have been praying about the amount that God would have you give to the world for world evangelism through your missions program here at church. And that's a vital aspect of the church. And I hope you've been praying that God's been working in your heart and convicting your heart about somebody going into missions. I ask that you've been praying about that. And it's vital that we, as God's people, get his mind uh, as of what he wants us to do in this cause of world evangelism, how much he would have us to give to the missions program. Because if you look and you read through scripture, you'll realize that, that God knows the need for world evangelism and he uses churches just like this one and all around the world to provide for those needs for world evangelism. And he uses churches just like this one and people just like you and I that he, he tells us, he shows us what we have to give to the missions program. It, it is one of those things that not only churches and Christians, one of the things that we, to say it this way, we don't use enough is the, the person of the Holy Spirit of God. Just like the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, the same Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The same Holy Spirit that lives in Brother David is the same one that lives inside of me. And, and it lives inside of people in the states and all over this world. And, and so I ask that you be praying about the amount because we all have the same Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said in John chapter 14, it is expedient or it is good that I go away, right? It is good. Now, the disciples didn't understand that at this point. He said, but if I don't go the way, the Comforter will not come. And the Comforter is the Holy Spirit that lives inside you and me. And, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, that's the word that is defined as another one of the same kind. Right? So just as Jesus shows a picture of the Father, the Holy Spirit is the same picture of Jesus Christ. And, and so in that, in our lives, in our churches in today's time, I, I submit this to you that even as Christians, we don't rely on the Holy Spirit like God the Father wants us to. See, the things that are happening now that we see in churches and in other Christians is because we rely on our own strength instead of the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of us. And if we were to live, if we were to listen to the Holy Spirit of God who lives within us, if you would be amazed at how things would work, things that would change, and it would change the world. Because only God the Father, the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit is what's going to take this world where it needs to go. So you and I as Christians have to rely on the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. And I want to show you an example tonight of relying on the Holy Spirit. See, when God gives you an amount to give to missions, it, it is relied upon Him. We are the vessel that He uses to give that to missionaries. God's going to do His part. It comes to the fact that we have to do our part. God's not going to fail, but sometimes you and I fail. And that's where we have to rely on the Holy Spirit in our lives. You see what 
what happens when we try to do things in our own strength? I don't know about you, but it don't work out too well for me. No. And so we need to rely as Christians, as churches today, rely on the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're looking at tonight here in Acts chapter 16. We see the apostle, the great apostle Paul. And this is something that happens in his life. He, we're here and he's on his second missionary journey. The first one was with Paul and Barnabas. And we come to this section. He's going on his second missionary journey. Now on this journey, we see Paul, if you would read the first uh, portion of chapter 16, we see this one, Paul and Silas are going on this missionary journey and they have developed a team here. And we know that the young preacher boy by the name of Timothy is with the team. And we see in verse number 10, when you read there, it says, we endeavor to go. The, uh, uh, the, the type Luke here is also with the team. Luke who wrote the book of Acts is with the team. So we see four of them going on this great missionary journey. And so on this journey, as well as in our life, I want you to notice a few things with me. Number one, I want you to notice the directing voice of the Holy Spirit. The directing voice of the Holy Spirit. As you read uh, in verse number six, it says, when they had gone throughout Phrygia, the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. And after, or after they were come to Mycenae, they had stayed to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mycenae, uh, came down to Troas. So the Holy Spirit is directing Paul and his team. And you think about the Holy Spirit is, is forbidding them to do some things. Paul wanted to go to these places and preach the gospel. But the Holy Spirit directed them to a different location. Paul and this team was definitely listening to the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now Paul here, he was making decisions on where to go and what to do. He had a plan. It wasn't a bad plan, but God stopped him. So number one under this, I want you to notice here, we need to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. We need to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Many years ago when I was in law enforcement, which was my career, uh, I was what they call I'm a supervisor on a SWAT team. Now what that is, is a SWAT team, that's, they call you in when the bad situations happen. Yes. We had a, a two, two teams. One was on call for one week, 24 hours a day. And we had another team. And the team consisted of about six to eight people. So we were on call this week, and uh, I received a call. Now I'm going to date myself. Does anybody remember the old pagers that you wore on your belt? And they would call you, and the phone number would come up. Yeah. Okay, that was me. I'm there. I wore that paint. I didn't, you know, it, it was one of those things. And so I get a 911 call. I mean, it comes up 911, and that tells me whatever I'm doing, I'm stopping and I'm calling in. So I call in, and when I call in, they say that this young lady had, had uh, disappeared from her house. And they didn't understand what was going on. Now, what do you immediately think in today's time happened to that young lady? They thought somebody come by and snatched her up and kidnapped her. Well, we didn't know anything. And so I called my team and I said, it's time to get going. we got to get down there. And this was in the southern part of the area where I was living. And it was, it was wooded. You could, there was no light out there. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face when it was dark. I mean, it was just dark. Brother AJ knows where I'm talking about. And, and, and so when uh, we get there, we assess the situation and we talk to the parents and we know that, I mean, they're friends. They really are and I understood. But we were able to get them calmed down enough to figure out that what she did, nobody took her, she wandered 
off with her dog into the woods. But that still didn't alleviate the fact she was missing. And so I start thinking, okay, how are we going to do this? I start setting up people around this area, and I'm like, we've got canines, we've got dogs that can track her. So I call for a canine. Well, a canine at that time was in another county, and it was going to be an hour before they got there. And I'm like, okay, now what do I do? And so I, in, in the state in which I worked in North Carolina, we had an option of getting a helicopter out there from the National Guard or the Highway Patrol. And so I called one agency, and they could, and they were down on something else. I called the next agency, said, we'll be there in 30 minutes. Hold everything tight. I said, all right. And so while all this is going on, I had a radio that I was listening to so that I could pay attention to everything that was going on. So I could see where my men were set up, see where other officers were set up, and, and I would know what's happening. And so I was listening, trying to direct everybody. Next thing I know, one of the guys came, one of the guys came over and said, the helicopter pilot wants to talk to the man in charge. And I said, I don't know who you're talking about. I ain't in charge of nothing. He said, well, you are, because you're directing everybody, and I was. So I went over there, and this is this tall, lanky man. I, I, I've never seen him since this day, but I never will forget his voice. And so all he does, I go over to meet him, and he hands me a radio, and he says, you listen to my voice. Who do you think you are? Like, I'm the man in charge. At least that's what they told me. And so, yeah, that's all he did. He gets back in the helicopter and, 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 and they take off. Well, they have this system on there. Uh, it's called a clear system, which detects body heat. And it was at night, so they turned this thing on. And, and uh, he says, okay, you listen to my voice and my voice only. He gets up in the air, we make communication. And I've got this other radio on. I'm trying to listen to everything else that's going on. So I'm listening to two different things. And, and so I get my team together, and he says, now I'm going to lead you in. Right? I'm going to lead you in. And I still couldn't really concentrate so what I did is I cut that other radio off where I could only listen to the helicopter. And he said, you follow my voice. And I said, okay, I can do that. And, and so he's directing my team in and, and, and by his way. So we're going in into this wooded area in the middle of the night and he's telling us which way to go. And I'll lift up and the next thing I hear, he says, do you see him? I said, no, I can't see anything. He said, do you see him? I said, no. So he gives us more direction. He said, he's right over to the right. And so we go over there to the right, and he was under this little wooden thing, hiding, just crying her eyes out because he's lost in his hand. So we grab her, and we take her back, and we give her to the
one time. But I promise you this, I'll never forget that one. And I'm telling you this with the Holy Spirit of God. When he speaks, you turn everything else off, and you'll never forget that voice. Amen. And that's the voice you need to rely on. And so in our, in our text tonight, uh, Paul is relying on the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because he's directing him of where he needs to go and what he needs to do. Now you think about this, it's been mentioned several times about the, the great commission is given to you and I. Right? It's just not given to missionaries, as Brother Dane said. It's given to every one of us. But we usually see uh, verses 19 and 20. That's what we normally see. But I'm going to read to you verse 18. And I want you to see this for yourself. That it says this, Matthew 28, verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power. Not some, not a little bit, not 99. All power is given unto me in heaven and Okay, and then this is what Jesus says in verse 19 Go, all power is given into me. You go, go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even unto, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Do you see the bookends of those verses? The first verse and the end? He says, Jesus says, listen, I have been given all power. And you see at the end, he says, I'm with you. I'm with you. And in the middle, do you see what Jesus is saying here? Hey, listen, you need to go, but you need to depend on me who has all power. See, when you and I live our lives as Christians, we need to depend on him who has all power. And he said he's with you. Many times we try to do things in our own strength. When we need to do things on the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Because That's what he was sent to do. To comfort, to guide, to direct your life. And so when you see that, you see the Great Commission, it, it is played out in the book of Acts. You see it in the book of Acts. The Great Commission. And so we must depend upon the Holy Spirit to help us to help others. Right? That's why we pray and ask God uh, what we need to do in this uh, faith promise mission. Right? And so you and I need to pray this prayer every day when we get up. Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll be anything you want me to be. I'll say anything you want me to say and I'll do anything you want me to do. So not only do we need to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, we need to heed the voice of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit will tell us and direct us if we go to Him, but it's up to us if we go or not. It's as simple as that. God's not forcing Himself on you. But I tell you, when He tells you to do something, it just simply needs to be obeyed. We may not understand it all, but we just simply need to obey him. Right? So you think about this, if, if, if this is a historic fact, because if God would have let them go into Asia, which is where they were wanted to go, they would have not gone into Philippi, which is what we know, as far as we know, the gospel moved, went into Europe, and then it moved west. Right? After years and years, the gospel moved all across this world. And this is really a turning point uh, in the gospel spread of world. It really is. 
It went into Europe and all across this world. Why? Because Paul listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Paul chose to follow the Holy Spirit of God. Secondly, notice with me tonight, and we'll be done here in just a minute, the detailed vision of the sinner. The detailed vision of the sinner. When you look at verse number 9 here, it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him. That word prayed there means to ask. Right? The world that we and I live in is crying for help. They don't know that they're crying for help, but we know what the world needs. The world needs the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel. Right? There's a place in everybody's heart that only God can fill. And people are trying to use drugs, they're trying to use alcohol, they're trying to use money, they're trying to use jobs to fill it, and there's only one thing that can fill it, that is the Lord himself. And that's when true joy moves in. Right? And so all over the world, in our own country, all over this place, people are trying to fill that void that can only be filled by the Lord Jesus. And so you and I need to realize we need to get that burden that, that, that we see these sinners. And, and I realize there's people out there that are hard to love. My wife reminds me, love them like Jesus. Love them like Jesus. One of the things that really bothers me, it really, really bothers me, is driving in a bunch of traffic. And we drive into big cities all over the United States and all this stuff, and it really bothers me. And I get frustrated. But my wife reminds me. You gotta love the white Jesus. And do you know what Jesus did? He saw a soul that was destined for one place or the other. Heaven or hell, there's no in between. And Jesus did not condone their sin, but he loved their sin. And you and I are the same way, and we need to be the same way. All these, these sins that people commit today, all these lifestyles, all these things, we don't agree with. But you've got to love your sin. You've got to get that burden. You may say, well, I don't have a burden for the law. Well, I ask God to give it to you. He'll give it to you, I promise. You remember the quote I said last night? The spirit of Christ is the spirit of mission. The closer you get to Christ, the more mission-minded we should become. Right? So the closer you get to Christ, the more you'll love what he loves. And what does he love? Right? He loves people. And I made the reference on Sunday about Ezekiel over 60 times in that book. 60 times in that book. There's a phrase in there that, that says, That they might know I am the Lord. He wants people to come to him in salvation. That's why he sent his son to the Lord Jesus. To pay the price to pay our sin debt. And I heard this by several preachers. He says, God sent his son and his son was mission to him. And so you and I, we need to be like the Apostle Paul here. He, he heard the Damascus all call to salvation, but he also had the Macedonian call to serve. And so you and I need to be like the Apostle Paul and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in us. And so you and I need to get that burden for the lost souls. We see people lost that are destined for heaven. And so thirdly and lastly, and I'll be done, the definite victory of the Savior. We talk about victory in Jesus. You know what? You and I, we need to start living like we have the victory because we do have the victory. Yeah. You read in this book, well, I'll tell you 
dollars a year, uh, uh, every month we give that trust to the Lord to give you that, to give to the mission to you. Uh, some of you are the bank, some of you are going to trust the Lord to provide for you. If that's five dollars a month, you say that, Lord, I'm going to trust you for five dollars. And then the Lord put that on your heart, and then the Lord put that on your heart. Write it on the card, you may put your name on it, but write it on the card, and we say that we come up with a grand total. We will be given monthly and a grand total that we a total that we give for the entire year. And we give that to Shinar, she can pay this amount for us. And every month we can watch that rise. And so uh, when we get back to the next year, Lord, to the uh, church, we will see that a big God that we serve, we know that we won't fail. Yeah, that comes through for us in our giving commission. So let's pray, even now, even tonight, pray for your dad, ask the Lord to show you what he wants you to give. And if you do, he will speak to you, he will direct you, he will you exactly what you need to give. You want to go with nobody else? He says, anybody else, worry about what he says to you. Ask him what he wants you to do. And I know that you ask that he will do it. So encourage people to come out, encourage all our members to be out tomorrow evening, uh, and bring someone with you. We try to give the mission uh, for us there. 2024, 2025. Uh, yeah, so we see that uh, prayer ask for what we got to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word, your word. Thank you for the fact that you hear that and give you these words about how you feel. Thank you for being the overarching of life. And being the way you feel that your life is not at this point. So we need to You may not understand. You don't need to understand. But Lord, we trust you. You know you will lead us. You are always the part of medicine. And so God, we just ask that you will lead us in the name of the Lord. Continue to lead us in the name of life and what he's doing for ministry of the other day. And then Lord, why do we want to start our Lord at the end here? Just the one here in the hospital. Show the Lord to do exactly what is wrong. Lord, your will be that you are in control. No medicine, no more than you Lord, you're in control. Provide grace to Sandra and Brother Mark right now. And so, Lord, let us just take care of it as well. Keep this heart, Mary, and those that are dealing with this situation, but our sister is there, Lord, your age. And then, Lord, press upon our hearts tonight that you would have us to give the mission. Show us the number. We write it on those cards and submit it in that you would give monthly to mission. God, you're able to do beyond what we are able to ask or think. Pray now as we go at this home to watch over us. Pray that there's one more people who doesn't know you as Savior. They come with saving knowledge of Christ. You are all in your presence, Holy Father. You have the Holy Ghost power. You have been living the life of you. Have you living your life now? In Jesus' name, your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.